going to tell you three stories in 10 minutes about uh, including customers. And the first story, here's the book. These are all from the book. The first story is from Africa. And as many of you know, the issue of uh, clean drinking water is one of, the, um, one of the pressing issues in that part of the world. And any invention or innovation that would do something about access to clean drinking water would, would improve or save many lives. So a few years ago, an innovation called the Play Pump launch. Some of you may know this story. This was, as reported, a um, ingenious water pump connected to a children's roundabout. And the diagram uh, that accompanied the press uh, showed children spinning on a brightly co uh, colored uh, play pump and water going through some plumbing and, and out of tap. There was a lot of news coverage in 2005 for this story. And these are some of the images that came with it. The play pumps spinning, and the kids obviously delighted with their new playground equipment and water flowing out. That uh, positive press coverage led to the very next year, $16 million uh, being given to Play Pumps International by First Lady Laura Bush, standing right beside Bill Clinton. That $16 million was at the Clinton Global Initiative. $10 million came from U.S. taxpayers uh, through the form of USAID dollars. $5 million came from the Case Foundation, and there were others as well. So at this point, Play Pumps International had money, they had a clever invention, they had A-list support from the uh, worlds of politics and technology and, and media. What do you think happened with the Play Pump? Well, this is what happens. And a lot of people were surprised and wondered what could have happened with the, the startup that had such great momentum. Well, a few years later, in the small country of Malawi, there are two Canadian engineers working for Engineers Without Borders that posted a quick YouTube video, still online, showing a race between two pumps to fill a bucket of water. So one of the aid workers goes to the play pump in the village and starts spinning as fast as he can. The water starts pouring out, and this is the scene. And when the bucket is full, the caption reads, three minutes and seven seconds, remember that. Then they go to the second contender. This is called the AfroDev. This is a traditional hand pump that's in a lot of uh, African villages in that region. It's been around for over 50 years. And he does the same thing. He pumps as fast as he can. The bucket fills up. Caption, 28 seconds. So that's a 6x uh, multiplier of uh, mechanical efficiency or inefficiency. But just uh, to make it even more interesting, they talked to some of the teachers in the village who had seen the play pump installed in, in their village and others in the area. And they asked them, if you ha do you have one message to send to the group that's installing these play pumps in the area? And the teacher said, yes, the messages stop immediately. And the reason why the teachers were so adamant about wanting the play pump installations to stop was covered well by a report that was commissioned by the government of Mozambique, uh, looking at the 100 or so play pump installations in that country. And an independent research agency based in Switzerland found the following. We found no signs that communities had been consulted prior to installation. In other words, communities or customers were not included, not in the design, not in the installation, and certainly not in the repair or maintenance of the devices. And this led to an even bigger problem. Because even though it was inefficient, at least it pumped water until it broke, like a lot of new technologies do. And once it broke, there were no parts and there was no training to, uh, to repair this. And at that point, um, many villages were left without water because in many cases, an unintended consequence of the project, when the Jeep rolled up to install the play pump, they ripped out of the ground a perfectly good working AfroDev hand pump, which was the village's only water source, and they installed a play pump, which then broke, and that left the village without water. So PBS Frontline story found around the same time that uh, there were many uh, women in many villages that had been without clean drinking water. In other words, this bright new innovation, which by the way, no kidding, was nominated for a National Design Award in the US, in many cases had the result of reducing access to clean drinking water. And the reason was that customers were not included, as I said. Now, were lessons learned from this? The Case Foundation was an early backer. And since then, they have done tremendously good work uh, on, on water issues. So uh, uh, this is not meant to uh, disparage them at all, but they're uh, conclusion in, the, in that original blog post was that this is just the very nature of innovation. You take risks, and sometimes things work, and sometimes they don't. And that's certainly a true statement, but that doesn't get at the full truth of why the play pump failed, which was that customers were not included. Okay, 
It's not just startups that have this problem. Enterprises do as well. Here's a very quick story from Walmart, a gigantic retailer in the US. And a few years ago, they wanted to compete with Target, which was starting to draw away some of their customers. The executives inside Walmart headquarters had a hypothesis that um, some customers were leaving because Walmarts were cluttered and kind of poorly lit and, and, um, and not so well designed. So to test out their hypothesis, they, they ran a checkout survey at checkout counters all over the country, polling thousands, maybe millions of customers, essentially with the following question. Would you like it if Walmart stores were less cluttered? And you never guess what customers said. Yes, we would like that. And so they went ahead and uncluttered the stores. Uh, no exaggeration, it cost them hundreds of millions of dollars to, in some cases, remove 15% of the product out of the stores so that when customers came into the nice, clean, uncluttered store, you can guess what happened. They couldn't find their brand, their favorite brand in the grocery section or wherever they were. And so what happens when customers come to Walmart looking to buy everything and they can't find anything? They leave. Sales went way down, way down. So the, uh, the lesson from the play pump is don't completely ignore your customers. And the lesson from Walmart is if you include customers in some way, make sure you do it the right way. Because doing research poorly, including customers poorly, is actually worse than ignoring them altogether because it gives you confidence in the wrong outcome. OK. When I've told some of these stories to some of the attendees here, here's the man who always comes up in conversation. Well, he's the guy who um, created customer experience by just creating something brilliant out of his mind. And whatever he gave them was what the, customer ex what the customers wanted. That's the myth, anyway. And it, we've seen a lot, read a lot about uh, Mr. Jobs. Around the end of his life, here's a couple of quotes that I saw a lot. One was that he didn't buy into focus groups, as though that was the only way to include customers. And the other was that the lesson was not to listen to your customers. And it's a myth, and it's a beautiful myth, but it's not entirely true. And the reason I say that is because there is tangible evidence. Again, it's on YouTube. You can watch it. A video from 1997, which I would argue was the low point of Steve Jobs' career. It was May 1997 at the Worldwide Developers Conference. You can tell it's the 90s by seeing the black patches on his jeans. Um, that was different from the, uh, from the more elegant aesthetic he had in later years. And he was facing a very angry um, uh, room full of Apple developers who were, really wanted to know what was happening with Apple and, by extension, their livelihoods. And one developer in this Q&A session stood up and said, hey, what have you been doing for the last few years? And sits down. And I think Steve understood that he was facing a possible mutiny. The, the entire future of Apple could have rested in the balance based on his answer to that angry developer. And if you watch the video, you'll see, uncharacteristically, Steve Jobs sits down on the stool and doesn't talk for 30 seconds. He's clearly thinking. And when he talks, he ad-libs one of the greatest answers to any Q&A ever. He revealed Apple's strategy that Apple was going to follow for the next 15 years thereby delivering us the iPad, iPhone, and all of, all of the other uh, innovations that they have uh, successfully delivered since that moment. And his answer was, this is verbatim, you've got to start with the customer experience and work backward to the technology. And this, remember, was to a room full of technologists. Steve said at the low point of his career, he was banking the entire future of his company on the customer experience. And the, the uh, after effects of that statement still echo today, even at DLD. I've heard many, many speakers saying something about this. And this is very much what Steve Jobs uh, based Apple on. So if you want to be like Steve Jobs, and if you want to create a great company, read the book, learn how to include your customers, and like Steve, you might just change the world. Thanks very much.